So my name is Mallory Haas. I've been working with the SHIPS project for the last couple of years. For the last year, I've been their archaeologist, um, and I was uh, located <coughs> in England. And while I was there, and I was over there last summer as well, we started this project with oral histories of early divers. And it kind of took on a force of its own, where it went from a, a small group of divers, and you go, and then it leads on to about five other divers, then it leads on to 15 other divers. And now it's a very large collection of divers who are now interested in talking to us. Um, with the SHIPS project, we do a great deal of um, different things with community outreach. We do finds recording. We do um, curation. Um, we also do um, <coughs> work on large-scale excavations. We were recently working on a project with the MOD for the Ministry of Defense on a pre-World War I sub. So this is how the interviews started. Um, we'd like to do interviews at least with having two people, and the uh, the diver, the person we're interested in talking to, or it can be five if they all decide to show up. So the kitchen would sometimes be extremely filled with people. Um, and normally it helps a little bit to have uh, whiskey or wine. You know, I always go over and you know present the bottle of bourbon I brought from the states, and it usually goes very well. So we wanted to know about the local wrecks in the area because a lot of them have been salvaged. They've also been picked over by the divers of things that you call spidge, the shiny bits. So you go for a scranny, or you go for an organized scranny, which is a fossic. And there's a whole fantastic terminology of the coastline in the Cornish. And putting that all together, it really is an ethnographic study in how these people were working and diving, and the way that they were scrapping was is that one day's of scrapping would be an entire week's worth of pay. And the new level of people that we started to look at, we finally got a hold of, like in the last two weeks I was there. So it was like this mad rush. And what they did is they weren't really keeping anything. Where the generation that came right after them kept almost everything. So if it was very interesting or it was connected to the wreck saying, um, they knew it was important. It just went to an auctioneer. Here's just some of the fantastic things that we get to see all the time. So you go over to someone's house and you know you want to talk about maybe a certain wreck that we're researching. They go, well, do you know, do you, do you have anything? Do, would you like to bring it out? And they present you with something like, oh, do you like that? And then you get the really good stuff. So something that goes on for like an hour now goes on for four hours. And we get to see all these fantastic things. And the other thing that happens, we go over we find something in there, we say, do you, do you know what this is? And they're like, no, not really. And well, this, is, this is actually really important. And then all of a sudden, it's like on the mantelpiece being like curated or being researched about how to, how to do it the right way, which is the case for this lovely, this lovely lady there. And this is Ray Eyes, the legendary Ray Eyes, the diver. Ray's place, or museum, is a couple of freight containers that are put together at a, um, a local wharf by, the, uh, by a port. And Ray's become the clearinghouse for almost all things nautical in Plymouth. So if uh, some divers go out for the day and they're sitting in the cafe and they find something, it just ends up in Ray's place. It's, uh, it's not curated. Um, uh, there's not really a lot of interpretation. It's a... it's just two rooms full of stuff, full of spitch. But if Ray hadn't have done this, it would have ended up in the skip. It would have been all in the dump. And then he, uh, he's also just been, it was five years ago, he was in, uh, they did a documentary on him called The Life Underwater, which I highly suggest that you watch. It's, on, it's online, it's on YouTube. And it would make anyone want to become a diver. So this is one day's worth of um, artifacts in the office. And we have all kinds of things here. The, um, the brass plate up there, the brass plate is from the James Egan language of World War II Liberty ship. <coughs> the cartridge shell um, to its left um, is also from the same wreck. We have a bell from, from the shipwreck, the Persier. Um, and then we found, this is also some um, copper plating from a wreck. Um, that we were excavating. It went down in 1811. Um, this is an um, olive oil jar from the 1700s. 
Also, we have this fantastic uh, navy wear ceramics that have also started recent, recently putting together, which has now gone from 20 samples to about 150. And we've got all of those to deal with, too. And then we also have some very interesting finds. What we thought what F was was the only amphora in, um, in Plymouth. There is another one because another diver came up and said, oh, I know what I have in my garage. And then T is the other Roman lead anchor stock in the UK. It's the only other one. And that was found on a diver's window shelf. We thought it was something very different. Um, cannonballs, also we have a stone cannonball there that came from the uh, new stone ledge site. So these interconnections of trying to be able to get a hold of people or how we, when we first started off, you know, they were, they were a little cagey. They are like, oh, we don't want to talk to you, we're archaeologists. So what happened in the last, like, six weeks while I, while I was over in England, we went to a postcard collector's club night to get postcard scans of the A7 project. <laughs> and while we were there, a man came up and goes, oh, do you go diving? Yeah, we do, we do 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 some diving. He's like, well, I did a lot of diving. You know, I, I'd be interested to talk. So we go over to his house, and we were there for about six hours. And he brought out just loads and loads of things, all kinds of stuff, boxes of coins and all kinds of things collecting for years. And that would be Mr. Neil Griffin sitting there. And we did an oral history with him and recording of some of his speech. And he, because he got very excited with us, because we were, we're always excited, then called a few of his friends, which led us to Mr. Trevor Wade here with the compressor. That is the original compressor in Plymouth from the 60s, which was just pulled out and sent to Ray's museum. It still works. <laughs> and up here we have the group of uh, the group of rogues that in front of Ray's museum on my going away night, which we were a little drunk. So, but they were all they all got very interested. So they were early divers that up until this point hadn't seen each other in at least 20 years. And some of them had passed on, but a lot of them, a lot of them were there. So while I was at a charity shop, I came across a book called The Voyage of the Arctic Turn. And while I was reading it, seemed a little bit coincidental that there was a man brought up called Bruno, who was a scrapper in, in Plymouth, started putting this all together and was one of the people that was on our list to talk to. Unfortunately, <coughs> he's dead. Um, known as the, uh, is it the, uh, the famous unwashed diver of Plymouth. <laughs> Stank, apparently. Um, I started reading through this, and there's all of this information of the divers in this book. Who's it, it's written by Hugh Montgomery, who worked on the Mary Rose. So through, again, the interconnections of archaeologists, he was in Plymouth at the time when Bruno was still alive. And right there is the Arctic Turn, which you get a whole collection of pictures from Trevor and from the old divers. They, you know, they bring to you, like, you know, at the party, you're like, set down this box of stuff, and you're like, look what I got. They bring out, you know, 40 pictures of early divers. And here's some of those fantastic pictures. And right here is Mr. Bruno. And the man in the center, um, would you guess his nickname is Scarface Stevens? <laughs> so these early divers um, were making their own wetsuits and cutting them out and sewing them and gluing them together. And the, the funny, the joke is that they couldn't get bent because they couldn't stay down that long. <laughs> you run out of air. And you can see this little haphazard thing of like pulling things together and zip ties and electrical tape is still one of the main things divers carry with them. So there's Mr. Ray Ives um, leading a new generation on with a uh, standard dress C.B. Gorman helmet. But are they really pirates? Because they came with all of these connotations when we first started doing this, that, especially from archaeologists. 
that they they don't care about history. They don't care about the stuff. They're just taking it. And in actuality, they're the best custodians for the job because they care so much. So if we work with them, like with Rave Museum, to do help with interpretation, to help with curation, going over every weekend and you know trying to help out in the best way, why wouldn't you let the community do it for itself? So I'd like to thank our fantastic uh, provider of money from the U.S. taxpayers, would be Promari. And, you know, do like what I do. I had the best job in the world. I always laugh with Pete, Peter Holt, that uh, I had the best job because he got all the worrying. So thank you very much, and that's my presentation. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I have cards and stickers and everything to pass out if you're interested. Thank you.